You know, since 1982, we had a colossal asset inflation in equities, in real estate, and since 1998, also in commodities. One day, this asset inflation will come to an end. The way the consumer price inflation in the 70s came to an end in, say, 1980, and thereafter we had this inflation. So it may be that the asset price inflation will not vanish altogether, but we may be in a period of disinflation. So if people are investing money, maybe they should adjust to the reality that the returns in future will not be 10, 20% per annum, but maybe only say 2% or 3% above the rate of inflation. And in terms of bonds and cash, it will be, say, 5% below the level of inflation. Well, this is a fascinating point you made to start this out as well, uh, which a uh, very important point here, which is that over the decades, each crisis has, be- has been larger than the prior one. That is that the crises are growing in size. It, I'm wondering, to widen our lens up a lot, is that an indictment of an exponentially growing debt-based money system? That, I mean, that is, is it just a feature of the money system itself? Or is this an indictment of human tendencies, how we tend to operate that system, or both? Well, you could build a conspiracy theory. Basically, the U.S. had a, a significant increase in the average household income in real terms from the late 1940s to essentially the mid-1960s. And then inflation began to bite, and real income growth slowed down. Then came the 1980s, and uh, in order not to disappoint the household income recipients, you essentially printed money and had a huge debt expansion. So if you have an economic system and you suddenly grow your debt at a very high rate, it's like an injection of a stimulant, of steroids. Mm-hmm. So the economy grew at a relatively fast pace, but built on additional debt. And this obviously cannot go on forever. It went on for much longer than I thought, because I started to write about excessive debt growth already in the late 80s. So I was very early about this. But when it comes to an end, you have a problem. So the Fed, that never paid any attention, the Fed is about the worst economic forecast you can imagine. They are academics. They never go to a local pub. They never go shopping. They Or they lie. But basically, they are a bunch of people who never worked a single day in their lives. They're not businessmen that have to balance the books, earn some money by selling goods, and pay the expenditure. They get paid by the government. And so these people have no clue about the economy. And so what happened is they never paid any attention to excessive credit growth, and let me remind you, between 2000 and 2007, credit growth was five times the growth of the economy in nominal terms. In other words, in order to create one dollar of GDP, you had to borrow another five dollars from the credit market. Now, this came to an end in 2008. Now, the Fed, that never paid any attention to credit growth, they realized if we have a credit-addicted economy and credit growth slows down, we have to print money. (laughs) So that's what they did. But believe me, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that if you print money, you don't create prosperity. Otherwise, every country would be 
unbelievably rich because every country would print money and be happy thereafter. <laughs> I think if it were possible to print your way to prosperity, <laughs> we'd all be speaking Latin because the Romans would have figured it out. They were very clever people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, the Fed, in my view, is dumbest institution because they could, if they read history, they could figure out what money printing does. But they do it. All right, so here we are in this path of printing, and um, I, and I want to speak of these local impacts down at the pub where, where you get a sense of things. A lot of talk on my site about the inflation the U.S. is exporting to the rest of the world. You live in Asia. What are you seeing from your vantage point there? Well, basically in Asia we had a lot of inflation and much more than what the government published. I mean, prices are going up substantially, and the economies are still doing reasonably well because we have a competitive advantage and we have domestic consumption growth. But basically, uh, there's a difference. I mean, everywhere I go in the world, there's one thing that strikes me. You go to a luxury hotel. There are Maseratis, Ferraris, Bentleys, uh, Jaguars, and so forth in front of the hotel. And the ordinary people are struggling. I see that everywhere. And so I think that in Asia we have also imbalanced growth and we have widening uh, social division and rising social tensions. And I also think that the Chinese economy, which grew trend line between 2000 and 2007, then they printed money, had huge fiscal deficits, and so forth. They are now in a significant slowdown period. I'm not talking about the stock market. Maybe the stock market goes up because of money printing. All I'm saying, the economy is slowing down very significantly, which will have implications on the global economy. So, in summary, we have... Uh... The idea that it's uh, might want to sidestep equities for now, the next few months, um, might be kind of interesting for equities, in part because uh, earnings... Well, I'm not sure. I think the market is overbought, and I mm -hmm. think correction is forthcoming. But, you know, who knows if there is enough money printing and markets are irrational at times, and mm -hmm. maybe they push them up more. But say the technical indicators have deteriorated. So, I personally... When I was uh, positive about equities in November, December, because sentiment was very negative, now I'm taking some money off the table. Some money off the table. And uh, the idea is to hold gold and silver as safely as you can, um, maybe in a, in a nice warehouse in an in a airport yes, district or something. Yes, also about gold and silver, I'm just telling people, you should buy it as an insurance. Right. It can go down 30%. We are in volatile markets, so, you know, you want to have your insurance safely. You don't want to leverage up in the futures market goal and it goes down 10% mm -hmm. and you're wiped out because of margin call. It's all a matter of degree, how much you allocate to each asset class. Agreed. And and so gold and silver as, as the core insurance policy at the center of a portfolio, that's the substance that will also never go to zero, at least uh, 6,000 years of history suggests as much. So so holding gold and silver... Yeah, but it, it probably can be taken away from you. Are you concerned about that? Yes. You yeah. know, looking at the government and the interventions into the economic system, Mm -hmm. And I mean, I tell everybody, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I think we had much more freedom than there is freedom today. And so this is a concern of mine. So, I mean, look, in my view, we are all doomed. But uh, maybe if you keep your gold in a safe place, you're doomed later than other people who have no gold and only paper money and government bonds. All right, and uh, I, I I like that view. So if we're all 
doomed in this way, though, you're really, this comes back to an indictment of the idea that our paper system itself, our paper money system is, is doomed. Not, I mean, we saw this in the 30s where our, even our gold money system had failed us at a period of time. There were productive factories and people wanted to work and there were plenty of raw materials or resources. What failed was the money system. So money systems can fail even if it's a gold and silver money system. But now we have a fiat money system that's been running amok. I just lost my line. Okay, well, I think we lost Mark there. I wanted to wish him well and, and congratulate him on just a wonderful interview. This has been a fabulous conversation that we've had. And to summarize, uh, he's looking at equities as being overbought at the moment, potentially, but that equities are ultimately a way that you can be assured of sidestepping some of the larger issues that are out there, which are sovereign defaults. And uh, uh, obviously very bearish on sovereign uh, debts at this point in time and, and uh, correlated debts around that. He mentioned holding gold and silver as safely as he could, but I think a very important point that he made that I want to reiterate here is that from his vantage point, it's ordinary people everywhere that are suffering and that there are social and political tensions that are following along with that. So this money printing, which is obviously a worldwide phenomenon at this point, is uh, impacting people disequally. So those obviously closer to the trough are doing quite well, and those further from the trough are doing less well, and that this is something that central banks have a tendency to both miss and uh, promulgate at the same time. He's also noticing that there is a slowdown in the economy worldwide, and so these are this all This concludes this podcast by so Chris Martin.